I'm a brilliant intellectual. As am I. The two of us are sick of dealing with troglodytes, and so we moved into a bomb shelter so we wouldn't catch the stupid. Now we pass our intelligence on by debunking YouTube videos. We are the, the debunkers. debunkers. This is Warren Buffett, one of the richest people in the world, thanks to the company he runs, Berkshire Hathaway. Basically, it's a holding company that just owns a bunch of other companies, Geico, Dairy Queen, a huge railroad, as well as a lot of stock in other companies like Apple and Coca-Cola. So when those companies do well and their stock goes up, Berkshire Hathaway stock goes up. When Buffett took over the company in 1965, a single share was worth $19. Today, it's worth nearly half a million dollars. Buffett owns nearly 240,000 of these shares. This is where his wealth is. But as he's been known for pointing out, Warren Buffett still pays a lower tax rate than his secretary. She pays at twice the rate I pay. I think that's outrageous. Absolutely. Income taxes must be cut. That's because they pay different types of taxes. His secretary pays income taxes on her salary, but Buffett mainly pays capital gains taxes on his sold stock, and that's taxed at nearly half the rate. The wealthy are definitely undertaxed. Buffett pays a different type of tax because it's a different sort of income. A person who works a job for an agreed upon salary is going to receive that salary. And if they don't, there will be legal consequences. But a person who invests could very well never see a dime. They're taking the example of Warren Buffett because he's successful, but countless people who invest don't merely fail to make money, they lose money to the tunes of hundreds, thousands, or even millions of dollars. Whereas no one loses hundreds, thousands, or millions working a nine to five. So yes, given the different risk factor, as well as the fact that the market needs liquidity and thus investors, we probably don't want to disincentivize investing with a higher capital gains tax. In the original CNBC video they're clipping, Buffett said the rich are undertaxed while answering a question regarding whether the wealthy would simply move if taxes on them were raised, the way that Warren Sanders and AOC wanted to in 2019. The CNBC interviewer even says it was almost the dodge of the question. Rather than respond, he says most people in the world, if given a choice, would move to the US. But the question is about a very small proportion of the world, the wealthy in in the US. He responds by saying that if you're 88 years old like he was in 2019, you would not move to protect your wealth even if half of it were being taxed by staying. In this way, he hints that the wealthy simply moving from heavily taxed places could be an issue. Indeed, migration data from the IRS shows that people actively move from high tax states like California and New York to states like Tennessee, Texas, and Florida, which have no income tax. More than 700,000 people moved from California to lower or no income tax states, taking more more than 50 billion in adjusted gross income with them. While New York saw more than 100,000 people move to states like Florida and Texas, taking with them more than 12 billion in AGI. In other words, you can't just keep raising taxes and expect people to stay and be taxed. Whether it's just staying in a state or country, people will move themselves or their money if there's enough tax incentive to do so. In the US, the disparity between the richest Americans and everyone else has been growing. And in the last 40 years, the after-tax income of the richest has risen more than 400%, while middle-class income has only risen 50 this is deceptive. Remember, the U.S. doesn't have fixed classes. It has income brackets, which people move in and out of over the course of their lives. It's not as if this data was collected by keeping track of middle-class families and noticing said families increase their wealth 50% over a 40-year period, while rich families being observed increase their wealth by 400% in that amount of time. It merely observed the amount of wealth in these pockets that people were moving in and out of, not how much individual families actually got. People move in and out of their economic brackets constantly. Many people who were wealthy 40 years ago are broke today. And many who were middle class 40 years ago are wealthy today. In fact, more than half of all Americans will be in the top 10% at some point in their life. Which is an unacknowledged reality that greatly complicates the data sets here. 
In fact, prior to the government lockdowns of 2020, the middle class was shrinking because of how many people were entering into the upper class. So the wealth of the upper class increasing is also a product of more people being in the upper class than ever before. But even among those who never entered the upper class over that 40 year period, those who remained in the middle class still likely got richer. Just not as quickly as the rich did. Which, well, duh, that's what being rich means. And has always meant. But being in a nation where the middle class constantly gets richer over time, and where people frequently move from the middle class to the upper class, is an incredible abnormality. And one which we're at risk of losing, given the horrific economic policy, not of failing to tax capital gains, but of printing trillions, destroying everyone's savings, and making home ownership nearly impossible for the average family. The way these people make money is very different than the way these people make money. And they're not taxed the same. I pay less in taxes than people that work for a living and make as much money as I do. This is Morris. He used to work on Wall Street. Now he's retired and lives off his many stock market investments. I own stock in companies, I mean, Berkshire Hathaway and Amazon and Apple. He's a pretty typical one percenter, except that he spends his money advocating for rich people like him to be taxed more. I want to live in a country filled with a middle class of people who can all afford to shop in our businesses. Oh, wonderful. Morris, whose last real job was working at BlackRock. I'm sure he's very aware of what must be done to help the middle class. The issue with the left's vision of economic social justice is that the only ideological tool they have is to increase taxes on the wealthy. And then eventually everyone else. But the problem with the wealthy in America isn't that they aren't having enough of their money taxed and then wasted by a corrupt and inefficient government. Rent seeking, outsourcing jobs, pandering to China, buying up residential homes so that there are none left for ordinary Americans. These are things the wealthy are doing which actually hurt the middle class. And last I checked, those aren't problems you solve by increasing the capital gains tax, unless more money being laundered in Ukraine or thrown at the next Pentagon spending proposal or wasted inflating healthcare costs or any other number of insane, corrupt, or inefficient government programs is your idea of helping people. Exactly. What ultimately bothers progressives is that some people have more money than other people. But in reality, Poor and middle class people aren't suffering or upset because someone has more than they do. They're suffering because the same political leaders who would be given more resources by a wealth tax made the decision to decrease the quality of life for the average person over the course of the next decade or more by printing trillions of dollars and giving most of it to the ultra wealthy. If any of that wealth happens to be taxed, don't expect a dime of it to be returned to you. If they wanted you to have it, they wouldn't have allowed it to be stolen from you to begin with. The money the bureaucrats want to tax is for them, not you. Most people have a normal job. They get a paycheck and pay income tax, ranging from 10 to 37%. But people like Morris, they make a lot of their income from investments, generally stocks and real estate. These investments are taxed as capital gains, and things like long-term stock have a maximum tax rate of just 20%. I sold some stock recently for $400,000, and my taxes on that have around $50,000. But that $50,000 is far less tax than anyone who has a job making $400,000 a year would pay. Yes, because again, someone making 400000 per year generally knows that's the salary they're going to make. There isn't the same level of risk involved. Someone who makes an investment might simply lose their money, so there should be a greater reward for that. No, I'm convinced. Let's lower the tax rate on the guy making 400000 Fair enough. And most of his wealth, well, isn't even taxable. We've covered this before, but that's because most of his wealth isn't actually wealth. It's theoretical. If your stock is worth $100,000, but you haven't sold it, you don't actually have $100,000. That stock could plummet to being worth $100, or even nothing before you actually sell it. If that's the case, then you never made any actual money. But whoever sold at the top did. Why should you be taxed for money that they made and you didn't? Not to mention, this would totally screw the market up. Anyone whose stock was doing well would be forced to sell some of it off in order to pay the wealth tax, which would actually lower the price of that stock overall and hurt other stockholders. Not just the ultra wealthy, but anyone bought into it, like people whose primary method of saving for retirement is investing in a 401k. For more info, check out our video on why unrealized wealth taxes are stupid. People like Morris or Buffett 
are worth so much money because of the stock that they hold, but it's not tangible, spendable, taxable money. I can look at my stock portfolio and I can say, oh, you know, I made a million dollars this year. But it doesn't mean I have to pay anything in taxes because our system is based on only paying taxes when you actually sell something. Yes, our system is based on taxing actual money you actually have, not theoretical money you might make or might not make depending on what happens in the market. This is all very theoretical, so to help you understand, here's an analogy we've crafted involving chickens. Okay, so imagine if for every five chickens a person had, they had to give one chicken to the government. That's how capital gains taxes work now. But then imagine the rules changed, and now you had to give one chicken to the government for every five eggs you had without knowing whether any of those eggs would hatch. Bingo. There's also another important detail left out in this discussion. Income tax is adjusted for inflation, but capital gains taxes are not. As inflation continues to get worse, that's taken into account, at least to some extent, by the IRS when they adjust how much a person has to earn to be in a given income bracket. But with a capital gains tax, inflation isn't taken into account. So a stockholder can be taxed as if they've made money when all they've done is keep up with inflation. For example, if someone bought a stock for $100 and then the dollar lost 10% of its value, the stock would be worth around $110. Not because the stock really increased in value, but because the dollar decreased in value. If the stockholder sells, he didn't make any actual money because the $110 doesn't allow him to buy anything that the original $100 did not so his investment was fruitless. All that happened was he broke even. But it doesn't matter. He's subjected to a capital gains tax even though he didn't make any real profit. In other words, he has to pay a tax because inflation happened. Amazon's Jeff Bezos, the richest man in America thanks mostly to his Amazon stock, pays almost nothing in taxes. We value his worth here, but it's never taxed unless it's turned into real money when he sells the stock and it's taxed as a capital gain. This is one way billionaires are able to be technically worth so much money, but pay so little in taxes. Value is not the same as income. Once the stock is sold, it's sold, unlike an income which is paid out in reliable intervals. Another point they're missing is that when a stock loses value, the stockholder is suddenly out all that money. If a stock drops to zero, the stockholder gets nothing from his income. So there's a major risk element involved in making your income primarily from stocks rather than a steady paycheck. If we taxed people at income tax rates any time their investment accrued value, that would disincentivize anyone from buying stock and would be a nightmare to manage, especially once inflation is factored in. It sounds like Vox wants to tax what you buy, sell, or just hold anything worth money. And once the president is set for the rich, what are the odds that such taxes won't be coming for lower tax brackets? Some billionaires like Elon Musk are able to get loans against their stocks and live off of that. They don't even need to sell the stock to turn it into spendable money. No sale, no taxes. The fact is, if you're a billionaire, you don't need any income. But they are presumably paying interest on those loans and risking losing the stock since they're using it as collateral for the loan, just in the same way that you could mortgage a house and turn it into spending money. It's not just free cash, it has to be paid back, and it accrues interest that must also be paid back and entails risk. Should the government tax anyone who takes out a loan and puts up their valuables as collateral? There's also a big loophole in capital gains taxes that the rich exploit called the stepped-up basis. If, hypothetically, Warren Buffett were to sell his stock, he'd have to pay capital gains taxes based on his profit, so the cost of the stock minus the original investment. But if he holds off selling his entire life, when he dies, whoever inherits the stock and then sells it would only have to pay taxes on what they earned after they inherited it, leaving all those original gains untaxed. It's part of what's called buy, borrow, die, and it's one way the richest families avoid paying taxes. Is this actually the argument they're going with? You're upset that people are exploiting the tax loophole of f***ing dying? Firstly, nice of them to keep framing understanding the tax code as exploiting it. Real neutral. But do the non-rich also exploit this loophole? Or is it okay to allow your children to inherit something when you don't have as much to give? Speaking of which, laws like this are actually better for the poor and middle class as they inherit a larger fraction of their wealth than do the rich. Furthermore, there are many reasons why stepped-up basis is a good idea. Without the step-up, 
heirs could face substantial tax liabilities that could mean they'd have to sell whatever they just inherited to cover the tax bill. This is especially true for people who might not otherwise be able to afford a home, thanks BlackRock, and inheriting one is one of the only ways they can realistically acquire one. If you can agree with this argument and say that if you're wealthy enough, it shouldn't apply, how do you justify that? Even if you were to set a baseline limit of only applying to millionaires, Vox is always arguing that the wealthy are incredibly good at exploiting the tax code. How does adding another complexity to it guarantee they wouldn't simply find another exploit to get around it? Further, past attempts at eliminating such loopholes have shown how difficult it is in practice. One problem was that moving to a carryover basis still created liquidity issues for some taxpayers at death because estates often must liquidate investments and realize capital gains to pay down debts. Besides, maintaining the stepped-up basis encourages the continuity of family-owned enterprises and promotes economic stability, especially in rural communities. On another note, Buffett has been shrewdly investing his money since he was a boy, and his wealth keeps growing. Meanwhile, the government has run the U.S. economy into trillions of dollars of debt. Does Vox think the government will invest that money more wisely than Buffett? It's this system and the fact that most taxable capital gains are going to the top 1% that lawmakers see changing the capital gains tax as an easy way to tax the rich. President Biden has proposed closing that stepped-up loophole and increasing the maximum tax rate from 20% to 39.6%. But just for people making more than a million dollars a year. Still no argument about why they should tax the rich more as opposed to other options, like cutting wasteful spending, of which there is a lot. For example, a report from the Government Accountability Office counted $281 billion in improper and mistaken payments in 2021 alone. Another report by Illinois-based nonprofit American Transparency found that the government spent insane amounts of money on ridiculous things, like... $465,339 on a casino for pigeons to study gambling, $7 million worth of paycheck protection programs to farms that don't exist, $75,000 to blow leaf blowers onto lizards. Huh. And many, many more ridiculous examples, like $477,000 on transgendered monkeys? And before you say any of these examples are just a drop in the bucket, you'd lose your mind if anyone avoided $477,000 in taxes. Yet you don't seem bothered when the money is spent in absurd and wasteful ways. Perhaps you just don't like when people have more than you. During the April 28th joint session of Congress, where Biden proposed the rate increase to 39.6%, he said this. When you hear someone say that they don't want to raise taxes on the wealthiest 1% uh, and on corporate America, ask them, whose taxes are you going to raise instead? And whose are you going to cut? It's telling that the only options Biden proposes are to raise taxes on someone else, as if they couldn't possibly reduce spending. Critics argue that it may discourage people from investing in the stock market, or that current millionaires would just sell less stock. But it would bring in more tax revenue, from more conservative estimates of $200 billion over 10 years to double that. It would also mean Buffett would pay a closer tax rate to a secretary. But this pile of unrealized money still goes untaxed. More fair according to who? They cite sources like the Tax Foundation for proof this would bring in, at the low end, $213 billion over 10 years. Oh wow! Less than is wasted in one year! Indeed. And let's see what their source says some of the other consequences would be. A negative 0.1% change in GDP, a negative 0.3% change in GNP, a negative 0.3% change in capital stock, a negative 0.1% change in wages, and 27,000 lost full-time equivalent jobs. Shrinking GDP and increasing unemployment to own the rich. They also cite Penn Wharton saying this new tax would raise 300 billion. But it looks like what Penn Wharton is actually saying is this. PWBM estimates that raising the top statutory rate on capital gains tax to 39.6% would decrease revenue by 33 billion over fiscal years 2022 to 2031. If stepped-up basis were eliminated, as proposed in President Biden's campaign plan, then raising the top rate to 39.6% would instead raise $113 billion over 2022 to 2031. There's a lot of things we could do to make the system more fair. We could have taxes on wealth. We could have taxes on gains in the stock market. None of those things would make anything more fair. And we already did a video covering why a wealth tax is stupid. Most Americans are bothered that wealthy people don't pay their fair share. What is a fair share? 
This seems to be their strongest argument for why the rich should pay more, but a summary of the latest federal income tax data shows the rich already pay more in so many ways. The top 1% share of federal income taxes paid rose from 38% to 42%. The top 5% share of federal income tax paid in 2020 was 62.7%. The top 10% was 73.7%. And the top 25% was 88.5%. With the top 50% being 97.7%. While the bottom 50% share of the tax burden was merely 2.3%. In 2020, high income taxpayers paid the highest average income tax rates, more than eight times the rate of the bottom 50% of taxpayers. The top 1% share of income taxes has increased more than anyone else's since 2001. Additionally, Pew phrases the question this way. How much, if at all, does each of the following bother you about the federal tax system? The feeling that some wealthy people don't pay their fair share. The narrator instead frames this question as, Americans are bothered that the wealthy don't pay their fair share. This removes the nuance of the question asked in two ways. By acknowledging this is how people feel, not that it's true, and that they were concerned about some wealthy people, not all or even most. It's ludicrous to think that you wouldn't be bothered by some well-off people taking unique advantage of the tax system if someone presented evidence of that. More importantly, the removal of the word feeling is revealing, because that's just what this concern is. A feeling, not a fact. And changing capital gains taxes wouldn't be the whole solution, but advocates argue it would be an easy place to start. Our system is making the rich get richer and richer and richer, and everyone else just not. Except Vox literally said, like four minutes ago, the system is making everyone richer, just not at the same rate. And in the last 40 years, the after-tax income of the richest has risen more than 400%, while middle-class income has only risen 50. Our system is making the rich get richer and richer and richer, and everyone else just not. No, 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 no. You see, they didn't say the rich were getting richer and the middle class weren't. They said the rich were getting richer and richer and richer. The middle class have gotten richer, and maybe even richer. Just not richer, richer, and richer. Ah. Uh, okay. 